Morning, Crossroads. Good morning. You caught me halfway there. Good morning, Crossroads. Good morning. Can I talk to Pastor Mike for a minute? Oh, jeez. Don't do that. All right, so a couple, couple housekeeping. And by the way, get your Bibles out. Merry Christmas. Um, I'm so glad you're here this morning. And I know kind of Christmas falling into the, week, the middle of the week is, 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 is the 20. Are we going to do Christmas on the 21st or are we going to do Christmas on the 28th? You know what the answer to that is? Yes. yes. We're going to celebrate. So, so you notice I'm, I'm dressed up a little bit for, for Christmas and that's just what I do. Um, so, and, and part of the reason is I'm not going to be here next Sunday. I'm going to be playing hooky in Haiti with the Haiti team next week, and I'm excited about that. Need y'all to be, need y'all to be, be praying for us. We are, we're bringing 520, 523 Haiti bags. Um, I love you, but if you give us more, we're going to have to pay extra like for luggage or something. So we're, we're going to be good. And by the way, we set a goal earlier this year of, of, we set a lofty goal of 500, and y'all just blew that out of the water. So thank you, Crossroads, for your, for your generosity and your love for children who live in what is probably the poorest nation of the world. And we are we're looking forward to taking the Haiti bags. We're taking, I think, it's a million and a half of those bracelets, those salvation bracelets. We have a bunch of those. We bought some soccer balls that, that share the gospel that we're taking with us. And then we've got some gospel tracks and Haitian Creole that I don't, I mean, I look at those and I'm like, what in the world? So yeah, because I can't read Haitian Creole. So, but we're going to go and I'm just excited about spending a week um, with, among the people of Haiti and just, just begging for God to move. So please pray. Uh, we're leaving Saturday, probably at like, oh, dark 30, right? We're leaving at like, God maybe not up yet before we go. It's going to be that early. I'm just kidding. I'm, you know, I'm just joking. We're, we're going to be gone before the sun comes up. So please remember to pray for us as we travel and as we go. We're excited to do that. And I'm loving the fact that, that what we've been talking about in one sacred effort, our giving to missions and being a part of that work as a Southern Baptist church is dovetailing. We, aren't, we, don't, just, we don't just pray about those things. We're not just giving to those things, but we've got people who are going and doing those things. Um, taking the gospel to the nation. So that's exciting. I love that. Um, and let me just kind of tell you how this morning is going to go. Um, I know I, there was one person who, like, when everybody was praying, they were, like, opening their envelope and breaking out their Lottie Moon offering because they weren't sure how that was going to go. I know a bunch of you, a lot of you, have given through uh, the, the, the Lottie Moon post office here at Crossroads. And if you've done that, um, thank you for your generosity and using that as a means to not only deliver Christmas wishes and love, to your, to your church family, but also to give to Lottie Moon through that. Um, I know others have been giving through other venues. You might have already given, and that's great. But let me just, let me just kind of say, uh, just kind of give us some direction on how this morning's going to go, because if I wait, I'm going to forget. Um, our invitation this morning is going to be that we would all come forward this morning. Um, God tells us to give sacrificially. Um, not out of our abundance, but sacrificially. So we don't have, I mean, we have, we, we don't do altars in churches because altars are, that word altar is translated into table of sacrifice. And the reason why we don't do altars is because the once and for all sacrifice has been made in Jesus. So we don't do sacrificial altars. We do tables and we don't want to ignore that. But this morning we're going to be um, just bringing our offering forward. And if you've already given, don't feel like we want to be left out because more than just giving our offering this morning here at the platform is going to be us coming and just like we commissioned the Haiti team last week, I want to commission that offering as a church family. And I want to ask God's blessing on, on those dollars that have been given to support our IMB missionaries serving around the world, some in places um, we would consider impractical or scary places to be. Um, so today is our day to say to them, we love you, we're with you, we believe what you're doing, and please, we want to send more. So thank you for that, and we'll kind of walk through that when we get to the end of this morning's message. Um, but today, I just want to talk about Jesus, and I want to talk about Christmas. Um, in, in, I, in the book of Isaiah, uh, which was written a full seven centuries, 700 years before Jesus would ever come into this world, um, the prophet Isaiah was, uh, was, was reminding, and I use that word intentionally, reminding uh, the, the, the people, um, the Israelites primarily, but, but his people 
anybody who would take notice that, that God was about to fulfill a promise that he made. And let me remind us, and maybe even for the first time you'll hear this, God made the promise to send Jesus into the world at the fall of man. When Adam and Eve fell and disobeyed God in the garden, God eluded to the promise of Jesus. And as he was, as he was passing judgment on to Satan, he said, man is going to crush your head, but you're going to bruise his heel. That, that simple statement, that simple judgment onto Satan was the word from God that ultimately sin, Satan, hell, death, all of that comes with sin would be defeated once and for all in Christ. And throughout the Old Testament, God had been reminding his people, I'm coming. <laughs> Remember the promise from Genesis 3, I'm coming. And, and as, as that revelation progresses through the Old Testament, it gets more and more specific to where you get to Malachi and really the picture becomes somewhat clear that we are right at the cusp of time. And Malachi was written, uh, I think, about 400 years before the actual coming of Christ. And at the end of Malachi, that final prophet, at least our Old Testament prophets, because um, he wasn't the last prophet, there would be one more, um, that there, God would say, I said all I'm going to say for now. And 400 years, there was silence from God. God didn't say anything new. Everything we, the people had from God was in the Word, was in the Old Testament. And then there would come one more prophet who was born, um, his name was John, born to Zechariah and Elizabeth, Jesus' cousin, He's the last prophet. How do we know that? Well, Jesus identified John as the greatest prophet ever to be born of a woman. And John had the sole task, as Malachi foretold, that he would be the one who would prepare the way of the Lord. And just months after John was born, we have what we celebrate, and that is the coming, the first advent of Christ God stepping out of heaven and into flesh, into humanity, born of a virgin. Not just born of a woman, but born of a young, untouched girl. He would be born free of sin. He would live his life. And throughout childhood, even through... You know Jesus never had terrible twos? Mary would have said, you know what? Jesus was the perfect baby, and she was right. He was good through two. Jesus never sinned. Even as a child... He was sinless. Really important that we believe that. It sounds almost impractical. How can a two-year-old not sin? I have a three-year-old. They sin. That's what they do. Comes naturally. You don't have to teach them to do that, right? They just know that that's how they feel. Jesus never, he, that's, he never was that. He literally was the perfect child. He grew up to be the perfect man. Never committed a single sin. Never committed a crime. Never even sinned by way of thought didn't do any of that, completely free of sin, which makes him the only one qualified to be the all-sufficient Savior. He gave himself over to his enemies. And by the way, let me remind us, that was you and I. It wasn't just the Romans, it wasn't just the Jews. As people who are born into sin, God's word makes it clear that we are hostile to God, we are enemies of God. And Jesus died for us. And in that sacrifice, he paid the price, his death, paid my ransom payment so that I would, would be free, I'd be set free from, from the damaging effects of, of sin and, and death. And God delivers me from those things. He adopts me into his family that when I come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, I am no longer an enemy. In fact, I'm adopted as a child of God. Where God now is not just God, now he's Father. Jesus is not just the Son of God, he is Brother and I have nothing to do with that. God does it all. Literally is the greatest Christmas present you and I will ever receive. And you know what? I'll just tell you this. We can never mix anything in to make Christmas better. There's a lot that we're given options to mix in to make Christmas more fun or better. If you need to mix something else in to make Christmas more fun, I want to just take some time this morning and just reintroduce you to the one who is Christmas. Jesus is Christmas. We don't need to add or take anything away from that to make Christmas everything that it is. 
in Isaiah chapter 9, we have this, uh, it be, it, the prophecy kind of begins in Isaiah 7, and a lot of us are, are, are familiar with that. But in, in Isaiah chapter 9, um, he, he continues um, as he moves through what God is giving to him. And I just want to talk about two verses this morning in Isaiah chapter 9. Um, if you would stand with me in honor of reading uh, God's Word this morning as we celebrate Christmas, I want to read uh, with you um, Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. We're going to read verse 7. And we just want to talk about Jesus this morning. Well, let's look at this together. For, un, for to us, or your translation may say, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government, notice that's singular, not plural, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, again, singular, not plural, and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. God, we... um. We want to come face to face with you today. Um, God, I pray that as we, as we dig through these two verses and God, as we look at the promise that you kept, a promise that you made at the very beginning when man fell, when we sinned, when we turned our backs on you, when death entered into the realities of what you created. God, from that moment, your love was screaming, it's not over yet. And God, you are a God who keeps your promises. If you didn't keep your promises, you would not be the God of the Bible. You have kept every promise. You have fulfilled every prophecy. God, today that we would celebrate, God, a promise made by you will be a promise that is kept. And God, as we even look at the first advent of Christ, God, I pray this morning we would consider your second coming. Because you came the first time, you will come again. And God, oh, how we long for that. God, this Christmas, I pray that we would celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. A promise you made, a promise you kept, and the evidence of that is in this room. You are here because as Christ followers, you are live and dwell inside of us. We are living proof of a risen Savior. Lord Jesus, would you speak to our hearts this morning? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you did receive a worship program coming in, and I hope you did, um, I think there's like a lot. You got like a book this morning. There's several pages that you got. Um, and, and please take advantage of uh, the Gaither Homecoming Tour coming to uh, the uh, the Jermaine Arena uh, later in January, and then uh, to the the Tim Hawkins concert. I think both those are going to be great opportunities for us to 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 enjoy each other and to enjoy um, just some unique opportunities in the Lord. Um, but there should be another there should be a listener guide in there with some uh, some sermon note opportunities there for you to take part in. So by way of introduction, uh, I want to I want to make some I think some 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 statements that I hope we would all just agree with. One of the joys of Christmas is the giving of gifts. Amen? Amen? We enjoy giving. Let's not be bashful. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. We enjoy receiving. Don't sit there and go like, I love giving, but you get all like lemon sourpuss face when you receive a gift. We, we enjoy being a benefactor of someone else's love for us. By the way, it's, it's but here's the thing. You got nothing to give until you've received first, right? So here's the thing. Jesus is God's great gift to us. He, he gives and we receive. I mean, this is, if we can receive Christ well, it kind of gives us some teaching and how we receive just the other things we'll get at Christmas well. Um, the whole purpose of giving and receiving is to actually model what, what God has, has done in us. We had a great need. God met that need in Christ. And here's the thing. In our exchanging of gifts, 
We don't want to pretend like that's not spiritual. It has a spiritual connection. Now, we can do those things unspiritually, or we can do them with the love of God that, that is working in and through us, right? So we, we love the giving and receiving of gifts. We don't want to shy away from that. But here's the thing. One of the joys, I think, is the giving of gifts, especially when it's a surprise. You've got, you're giving a gift to somebody, and they have no idea what's coming. I mean, one of the joys of Christmas is blindsiding someone you love with a gift they weren't expecting, right? One of the joys of Christmas is receiving a gift that you weren't expecting, okay? Um, that's, that's all good. Now, I'm not saying, and maybe for some of us it is, you know, you open up the, the wrapping paper, and, and oh, look, it's a pair of six socks you know it's okay you might you might jump for joy at that especially if you're desperate for some socks right and sometimes you're blindsided by that but but there's going to be some other stuff that you'll get that you'll just be wowed by and i think that's a great a great thing that would drive us to worship because again it's god that gives it all so let's kind of refocus this god's gift of the messiah while not expected was certainly not a surprise again the promise of christ God said, here's what I'm going to do. And as the Old Testament works its way through, it becomes more clear that there would be a Messiah, that he's coming. Now, when Jesus came, did everybody go, oh, the Messiah's here? No. In fact, you had three foreign magi. We call them the three kings, but they're really three wise men or sages. They were the ones who saw the star, connected the dots, and went on a journey. They caught it, but not everybody did. So the coming of the Messiah was... Not necessarily expected, but it shouldn't have been a surprise. Why? Because it was a promise and a prophecy fulfilled. Things that God has spoken of from the very beginning of time. Now, I think this passage in Isaiah kind of peels the curtain back on this as we look at the gift of the Messiah and how all this plays out. So let's look at the first aspect. Let's look at the first part of um, of verse 6, and let's talk about the gift of the Messiah's arrival. The gift of the Messiah's arrival. Um, these verses, these, these just this well, just these two cup, this couplet, this these two statements. Um, we have some incredible claims, great claims concerning the Messiah, and a few were fulfilled um, in his first advent. Let's talk about that. Not all of the gifts of Christmas are things that we can enjoy now. At least the ones that we're going to talk about here. Jesus is wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's all of those things. But we get, we're going to get to a point in this passage where we're going to talk about um, a government and a, a, an establishment of his kingdom. And some of that we, we, we are the recipients of, and we're, we're kind of working through that as a church. But ultimately, we are longing and waiting for Jesus to come again. Amen? Because there's a first coming, there's a second coming. Let me give you a bit of, just a little bit of Christmas trivia. The Jesus... The coming of Christ, the first advent of Christ, is well documented in and through the Old Testament. However, biblically, it is Christ, Christ's second coming that we actually have more in the Scriptures about Old and New Testament. The Bible talks about Jesus' second coming more than it talks about the first. That's, the, that's kind of the main, the main point here, and that's what I want to say here, that this passage even alludes to Christ's second coming. But here's the thing. I don't know that I would be too excited about Christ's second coming until we handle rightly the first. Nobody should be longing for Jesus to come again unless they have a right relationship with God. Because the Bible talks about, and there, there have been messages preached throughout history, one of the, one of the most popular most, a message that you can go online and read is a message preached by Jonathan Edwards called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Let, 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 let's, let's be reminded that God is an everlasting Father. He is a loving Father. He is benevolent. He is kind. He is also those things. But He is also a wrathful judge. And he's coming back. Well, that's not Christmassy, is it? It actually is. And here's why. The only way we can know God in who he is as loving father is that the wrathful judge part of who God is is poured out on Christ. That's something we, we can't avoid or ignore. We have to recognize all of this. So let's look at this first couplet here. We have in Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Now that's not just poetry. It is, but there's more to it. Let's break these out. The phrase, a child is born, this identifies the Messiah as a man. A child is born. 
This is a reference to the humanity of Christ. Mary gave birth to a baby over 2,000 years ago, and that baby was fully human. He was man in every, in every sense of the term. And like every other human being aside from his birth, let's just kind of go through this. Because Jesus was human, he experienced happiness and sorrow. He experienced joy and pain, hunger, thirst. He knew what it meant to be tired at the end of a long day. The only thing, in fact, we can, we can write this one down. The only thing that Jesus never shared in his life that every other person has is sin. Everything else he experienced. Everything else he knew. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a little bit. But let's just kind of work through this. The point of all of this is that through the virgin birth of Christ, God Almighty steps out of heaven and becomes human. In John 1, 14, and I've got this up on the screen, but you can, you can note this and you can reference this later as you have opportunity. John 1, 14 says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you read up from John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God, the word was God. We have that, that declaration. So when we see now translating into verse 14, the word becomes flesh, God becomes flesh and dwells among us. John says, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is fully man, but he's not just fully man. He is also fully God. Look at that next statement. To us, a son is given. This statement identifies him as God. What does John 3.16 say? If you push on later, deeper into John's gospel, um, Jesus about himself says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Well, that is a reference back to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. A son is given. Whose son? Well, he's not just Mary's son. He's not just the adopted son of Joseph. He is also God's son. This is a reference to Christ and his identity as the second person of the Trinity. He is the co-eternal God. In fact, if you push on to Colossians, Paul says that Jesus is the agent of creation. So when God says, let there be light, who said that? Jesus did. He's the agent of all creation. Everything was created by him, for him, and through him. Let's, let's just kind of deal with this practically. God in the person of Jesus did not come into the world as a fully grown man. That would be awkward. And that, that would actually not fulfill the prophecy. Jesus had to come the way he came or he's not the Messiah. So he can't enter the world as a fully grown man. And Jesus didn't become deity or become God when he was baptized or at any other point in his life. He comes, God chooses to come as an infant. But make no mistake, that child, that baby was God in every sense of the word. Now, we know these truths, we've heard them, we believe them, hopefully we do, and we celebrate them. And by the way, that's what celebrating Christmas is really all about. It is the celebration of God coming into the world. It is the celebration of Emmanuel. God's greatest gift meets our greatest need, and the greatest need we have is God himself. He is our greatest need. He is our greatest need, and we are empty and lost without Him. The Scriptures are clear, believing and knowing that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. Is a, is, these are essential truths to our faith. Essential truths. This means we, we don't share the Christian faith unless we embrace these truths. These are essential. Okay, now, it, it, now also, let's just hammer this out. Being fully God and fully man, it means that the innocent Jesus died for the guilty us jesus is innocent of all sin sinless right that's not us standing before god apart from christ there's going to be a gavel that falls and and that we're going to hear one word guilty um there's a penalty that comes from being guilty 
The penalty is eternal separation from God in a place called hell. And hell is a place, it is a real place, where it's not just that God is not present, he is present, but it is a place where those who are separated from God forever will experience the only side of God, and that is his anger and his wrath, and that will be for all eternity. That's what makes hell so scary. And that's what should motivate us, by the way. When we think about Lottie Moon, there are people right now dying in parts of the world. They've never heard the name of Jesus. They've never heard the gospel. And we are committed to these truths, and we believe them. In fact, we celebrate them. I'm looking at the red and green around the room. And I feel left out because I didn't wear anything red or green. Um, How can we celebrate Christmas? I mean, really celebrate it when... There are people in the world who, it's not just they don't celebrate Christmas, it's that they're going to hell. And unless they hear the gospel, unless we intervene, people who know Jesus, unless we intervene, that is going to be their eternity. And I don't know about you, but knowing everything that I've received from God, knowing who I was, the depth of my sin, the pit that I was pulled out of, you know, we can't help, I think, but to give sacrificially to the greatest cause the world has ever known. His sacrifice means everything. Because Jesus, innocent, died for us guilty, it means that sinners can be saved. They can be saved. We can be saved. You, if you are a Christ follower, you have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Yet in all these truths that Isaiah mentions, just in these first two phrases, those two truths kind of point us now to what he talks about next. Again, we celebrate the first advent of Christ, the first coming of Jesus, but we long then for his return. And Matthew speaks of this, the promise of of his return. Matthew 25, 31. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. That's what we long for. But we, we can't get here. We can't enjoy and celebrate those things. And again, unless we handle the first coming of Christ the right way. So the Bible just doesn't tell us what the promise of Christ's first coming and how all that plays out. We also know that he's coming again. And when he does, the rest of the Christmas gifts that he asked for us, those things will be given. So I guess what I really want us to see is that we, we're, we, we enjoy an aspect of Christmas. We enjoy a part of Christmas. But just like, have you ever heard, it's the gift that keeps on giving, right? Have you heard that? Um, maybe it's those socks. You get them once, but you wear them over and over and over again. It's the gift that keeps on giving, so long as you wash them. That's a rule. So we're moving on from that. Christ, he is the gift that keeps on giving. Why? Because it's not just that he comes and we're saved. And we get to go to heaven. No, his promise is that he's coming again. And he will establish something that we can barely wrap our minds around. And that's what the following verses kind of of allude to. So let's talk about that gift in terms of the Messiah's attributes. We've talked about his arrival, his coming. Now let's talk about his his attributes. Isaiah tells us that when Christ comes, uh, he would be given many titles. Okay, many titles. What, what are they? Well, let's just kind of read them through. He shall be called Wonderful. I think that's awesome. Wonderful. What does that word mean? Let's kind of unpack that. That word wonderful gives the implication of supernatural, but also there's a secrecy to it and also something that's extraordinary. It's a deep word. This name points out the truth that there is nothing common about Jesus. There's nothing common about Jesus. You can't be fully God and fully man and be normal. He wasn't common, and he isn't just a miracle worker. He is the miracle. This idea of Jesus, who Jesus is, is so, I think, far beyond our level and our ability to understand and to comprehend. We're never going to figure him out. Yet, he can be known by a little child, and that's that's incredible, isn't it? That the infathomable, infinite God can be known by a child. Only God can do that. He is wonderful in every aspect of who He is. His words, His works, and His ways. He is wonderful. But it doesn't stop there. He says He's Counselor. 
Some join, some, some uh, translations join that. Some you'll have a comma in between those two words, that's fine. Um, th- this word counselor, it means one who advises, one who gives purpose, one who devises and plans. It refers to his role as a leader, as the guiding force of our lives. I love that. How does, how does Christ do that in our lives? Well, this translates into what we are promised in and through the New Testament, when Jesus said, okay, I'm leaving, I'm going away, but I'm sending someone else, the Comforter. I'm sending the Holy Spirit to come, to be your teacher, to guide you in every sense of the word. In fact, part of what the Holy Spirit's job is, is to counsel us. Now, I think it's pretty good that God himself and the personal Holy Spirit would be our counselor. Because I don't know about you, but when I need advice, I go to all different places. And I'll be honest and say, God isn't always the first person I go to. But here's the thing. If one of, if, if as a child of God, if one of my counselors is God himself, and he knows everything, like even me, he knows everything about me, everything about my situation. In fact, he's the guy who put me there. Shouldn't I be going to him for counsel? Shouldn't I be turning to, to God's wisdom to gain what I don't have so that I can be guided? That's, he's our counselor. And certainly, will God use others in our lives to counsel? Yes. But it will ultimately, all that will come from, and, and to, from him and, and to us. He's wonderful. He's counselor. But he's also mighty God. I love this word. The easiest way to translate this is he's a hero. He's the hero that you needed. He's the rescuing knight that you needed. Now, I know ladies in the room, you, you get that rescuing knight thing and you land square on those things. You're like, yes! And, and, and guys, it's, it's hard for us to think in those terms because if he's the rescuing knight, it's a hard time for us to realize that, you know, we associate that with a, a damsel in distress, right? So we have a hard time getting there. But gentlemen, let me just remind us, at Christmas time, you needed rescuing. There's no bootstrap that you could pull on to pull yourself up and out of the pit that you were in. There's nothing you could do for yourself to, to, to accomplish what only God could accomplish. You needed God to charge on his horse into your life, every one of us, and to rescue us because our enemy was too great. We needed him to defeat our enemies. He is our hero. He is strong. He is mighty. He is invincible. And he alone is worthy to be our hero because he is the one who has defeated all of our enemies. Biblically, what are our enemies? Let's just rattle off five. Death. Sin, yes. Satan, absolutely. The grave, yes. Eternity, hell, yes. He defeated all those. And let me just tell you, it's not that Jesus, well, I could beat three and Jesus got the other two. You're incompetent. And we all are. None of us can defeat any one of these enemies. No one here is going to defeat death. None of us is going to cheat death. You and I, we're going to die. But in Christ, he says, we're never going to taste death. Sin is overcome. Sin no longer has dominion over us, according to the Apostle Paul. Satan is defeated. That that prophecy there in Genesis 3, where God says, okay, I'm going to crush your head That happened on the cross and in the resurrection. Satan was crushed. He's defeated. The grave, Jesus walked out. Why? As a a sign and a promise that we, for those of us who have repented of our sin and turned to Christ in faith, we too will be resurrected. And hell? We will have no part of hell for those of us who are in Christ. Why? Because hell is a place where God's anger and wrath is poured out for all eternity. Jesus took that on the cross. I was talking with someone earlier this week, and, and, there, and, and this individual made a comment, and they said, well, I hope God's not mad at me. I looked and I said, God's not mad at you. He stopped being mad at you when Jesus died on the cross for you. You mean I can do whatever I want and God's never going to be mad at you? Um, if you're thinking that way, you might have a problem. But we do that, don't we? How far can I go until I really get in trouble? Christians don't think that way. We think about how far can I run away so that I could be holy and righteous in God's eyes. 
Jesus accomplishes all of that on the cross, and he, he is our hero. And the, not just that he's mighty God, but he's everlasting Father. And I love how Isaiah just drops that. He's everlasting. He's eternal. He never ends. We might die. He never will. He is the great I am. He is our Father. And I love that word Father because that, it's one of the few times actually in the Old Testament the word Father is really referred to as God. It's really not till, till we get to Christ and, and, and he refers to God as Father, not just Father, but our Father. Well, here in Isaiah, we get kind of a, a prelude to that. He brings us out of sin, out of death, out, away from Satan, who is our master, out of the grave, and, and, and saves us from eternity in hell. And then his identity for us changes. He's not just God anymore. He's Father. It's relationship. It's intimacy. Jesus died on the cross so that the thing that you need would be given to you, would be restored to you. And your greatest need is not heaven. Can we please stop peddling heaven? Jesus died on the cross so that we could have the Father. And we gain heaven because we have relationship with the Father, not the other way around. Jesus died so that I would have relationship with a Father that I never knew, who would adopt me because I was outside the family. It's incredible. A heavenly Father that, that loves supports, he sustains, he comforts, he provides. He's also the Prince of Peace. I love that because I don't know that we really know what peace is. Peace for us, I think for us in a lot of cases, is just the absence of conflict or hostility. That's not peace. That may be the best we can achieve. Genuine peace is not just the absence of hostility. It is something far greater, far more than that. It is where the things that create conflict and hostility are gone. They are removed. And only Christ can do that. He will rule and reign His kingdom in peace. He creates peace. He provides peace. And, and those who, who know Him, we understand what peace is, because if you remember what the angel said to the shepherds, or at least in the shepherd's presence, right? In Luke chapter 2, glory to God in the highest and peace. Well, what is he talking about? Let's be clear, it's not world peace. It's not the world gathering around the fire and singing kumbaya. That's not what that is. This is God declaring that the hostilities between him and us are going to be over and they're going to be set aside because of Christ. That the war between man and God will come to an end and Jesus is the promise of that peace. Right now, as we look at, as we look at Jesus, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, the world, and I'm talking about the whole world, not the church, but the world, we can do little more then pay lip service to this person who has all these titles. We can just pay him lip service. They, we don't, people who are outside of Christ don't know him. And a lot of what the lip service that the world gives him isn't really good, is it? His name is often used as a curse. Some have reduced the person of Jesus or Christianity or our faith as some sort of cosmic good luck charm. Many simply see Jesus as a terrible lie that has to be eradicated. Um, and he gets maybe some token attention around Christmas time, maybe. But largely he's been replaced with other things. When Jesus does come and when he comes again, his gift, the Christmas gift that is promised and fulfilled in the first coming that will ultimately will play out in his second will be his sovereign rule and reign when he comes the world will acknowledge him to be all that he is all the things that he's that's been said about him or or done or every curse all of that is going to be set aside and how do we know that well the bible tells us that everyone in the world will bow at his feet and acknowledge him to be lord of all Many of you know the passage in Philippians 2 that I'm about to read. Therefore, God has 
highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of, say it, Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and yes, even under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have one more little journey to make through this, but I want to just stop and say this to you and just ask you this question. Read, let, let's read that again. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what the difference is between someone who is saved and someone who's lost? Someone who's lost, they're going to bow. They will verbally, according to this, they will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. The purpose of the gospel, the purpose of what we exist for as a church is to spread the name and the fame of Jesus so that people would come to a saving faith now. Because when Jesus comes again and the testimony of the scriptures is clear, when a lost person at this point declares him, this is going to be a damning confession. They will make that confession and they will join the rest of those who are under the earth. And that will never end. That's incredible. People, and here's the thing, for us, when we hear the truth of the gospel, that Jesus came to die and to save us from our sin, that if we would turn from our sin, have a change of heart, change of mind, that leads to a change of life, that only God can reckon in us, that we would put our full faith and trust in Jesus, we can bow now. We confess now. And we live our lives now in the truth of those realities. But there will come a day where every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. And you know what? Not everybody doing that is going to be happy. Some people are going to do that. And for all eternity, they're going to, to live with the realities of, of who Christ is and his identity as the Messiah, the Savior, the ultimate promise that God has fulfilled. When he comes, when he comes, the world will acknowledge him to be God. The world will acknowledge him to be Lord, and the world will acknowledge him as king, period. My question for you is, is have you done that now? Does your life reflect that now? Are you living a life that exudes your belief in Christ, your trust in the Lord? I would argue, looking at all of what Christ says he's going to do, all of that identity, does the world need a wonderful counselor? Desperate. Does the world need mighty God to sit on the throne? Yes. Everlasting Father? Yes. Prince of Peace? Yes. The world, is fact, is so desperate for it that, that we're looking for it everywhere. Just a taste, maybe even just for a moment. But there is coming a day when the world will enjoy His rule and His reign when He comes. So Christmas really isn't just about Christmas. It's about Jesus came once as the meek and humble Savior who died willingly for you and for me. He's coming again. And the words that will be attributed to his, by his enemies are going to be he's arrogant. How dare he come in riding on a horse with a sword? Make sure you have the full picture of Christ. Because here's the thing. There are only two sides in this. You are either with Christ on his terms or you are not. And if you are not, the invitation for you today is that you can be because he loves you and he came to rescue you from yourself and from your sin and from his own wrath and judgment. Lastly, let's look at the gift of the Messiah's achievements. The gift of the Messiah's achievements. Look there in verse 7. Once we establish his identity, in who he is. Look at what's going to happen. Isaiah tells us that the coming king will rule with judgment, yes, and with justice for all time. The increase, I love this, and I pointed this out as I was reading the text, of the increase of his government. <laughs> oh, Jesus is not going to come and just rule over all the governments. No. There's going to be one government. And it's going to be his. And he's going to be in charge. 
So I know there's a lot of books and stuff out there. Oh, be afraid of the one world government. Don't be. Jesus is going to be the one world government. And that's got to happen before he comes. Right? So let's just, let's just acknowledge that he's really in charge. And the way the world is going to go, it will all happen as he has prophesied and as he has promised. But I love that. His government will increase. There'll be peace. And that peace will have no end. He will sit on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from the time it begins and forevermore. I love that. All it takes is a simple glimpse of our world to understand that this Christmas gift has yet to be delivered. We're still waiting on this one, aren't we? I think so. From county seats to world capital cities, is there peace? No. Leaders are often bent on the acquisition of power to the degree that what is in the best interest of, their, of the people they serve is all but lost. There's no peace in this world, and there never will be as long as we're in control. What is in peace's place? War, racism, crime, disease, turmoil, chaos, anarchy. The human race seems to be losing its grasp on what is right and wrong. For all of our advancements technologically, we seem to be losing the core of our identity. And the only way that can ever be restored is, is going to be in Christ. Why do all those things happen? What, why do we have all of that? Well, there's one reason for it. It's called sin. Sin our sin, my sin, puts us in, into direct hostility with God. And, and because man is at war with God, we are at war with each other. And I think this is what the angels are rejoicing over, the night that Christ was born. Christ is the only one that can bring genuine peace to the world. And He's not going to come and negotiate for it. He's not going to come and sign a treaty. He's just going to come and He's going to establish it. Glory to God in the highest. Why did Jesus come? To the glory of God. And by the way, isn't that interesting? The angels declare that first. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. This kind of peace begins with a relationship with God, establishing peace with us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Then, I believe, and only then can people share peace with each other. At least that's the way it should be. Consider this. Just think about this. There's no hope for peace apart from the gospel because of man. And man left on his own is incapable of peace. I think Galatians 5, what the Apostle Paul shares there is bearing this out. But the fruit of the Spirit, ready? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then Paul goes so far as to say, against such things there is no law. Isn't it interesting that God's peace is a fruit of the Spirit, not something we can conjure? So when we have an absence of peace, what do we have an absence of? The Spirit of God. Church, are you hearing me in this? Where a church is experiencing conflict and hostility is an absence of the Spirit of God. The Spirit brings unity. The Spirit brings peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and all of those things. It's only the Spirit that brings that. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit that comes when we are in right relationship with Christ. And while we will never see peace maybe on the world stage until Jesus comes, we should see peace among the people of God and that should be normal. It should be normal. That's if we're saved. That's if we're saved. Because if we're not saved, if the people who are the church are not genuinely children of God, then the Holy Spirit's not going to produce a fruit because He's not present. So our message, I think, should be, how do we battle for peace? And that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Battling for peace? But on this side of eternity, we have to battle for peace. Which is why the mark of discipleship, and if you're in the basics class, we talked about this verse. How do we have peace when everybody is living out Luke 9, 23? If any man would come after me, let him 
deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You know why we don't have peace? Because we don't deny ourselves. We want what we want when we want it. And then we sometimes use the scriptures to justify it. No way. You know what God says to that? I won't bless that. I won't honor that. I won't support that. If we want peace in the world, then what do we have to, what do we have to be? If we truly want peace in the world, there has to be peace here. Because we have to show and demonstrate what God's peace looks like. So the world looks in and goes, oh, that's what peace is. But when the world looks in to the church, what do they see? The same thing they see everywhere else. It's kind of a hard thing to, kind of, uh, to overcome. We kind of establish a hurdle in front of ourselves when, when we're not battling for peace and we're not intentionally denying and dying to self as we go. But consider these things. When Christ returns, he's going to deliver justice, peace, perfect judgment. So imagine what this looks like. Imagine a world where there's no war, no poverty, no injustice, no religious or racial junk. Imagine a world in where every citizen worships God and bows to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Imagine a world in which every ruling handed down from the throne is perfect and is in the best interests of both God and man. Imagine a world that is marked by perfection in the very presence of God. Imagine a world where there's no poverty, no inequity, no mistreatment of the poor and the weak. Imagine a world where there's no sickness, no disease, no death. Imagine a world where righteousness, holiness, and peace are the ordinary course of life for everyone. If you can wrap your minds around those things and you long for those things, it is only in Christ that they'll be had. And when Christ does come, that's what the world is going to be. And I don't know about you, but I have a hard time imagining that because I've never known anything different. That's the world Christ will create when he comes, when the curse of sin will be removed and he restores the beauty and the glory that was broken in sin and all of creation. When Jesus comes, he will give the world everything it would have had if sin had never entered and destroyed everything. And I believe with all of my heart that that is a world that our hearts ache for. And yet apart from Christ, consider our efforts, the Peace Corps. It's one of my favorites. People who surrender and sacrifice their lives, which I think, by the way, is a good thing. That We are working for peace in the world. But apart from Christ, it's empty. Every effort we make to bring peace and justice into the world is empty apart from Christ. So church, what's the answer? The answer is Christ. The answer is the gospel. The answer is the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for crying out loud. The answer is to proclaim and to propagate the gospel into all the world for all time for the glory of God. We say we want peace. Really? Here's our opportunity to prove it. Here's our opportunity to say what, what, what God wants is what we want and we're going to be a part of the greatest cause the world has ever known. And this cause is life or death. It is life and death. You and I, we are watching the world as it drowns. We're watching the world as it is consumed in the fires. And we have an opportunity now, on this side of eternity, to partner with God in the ministry of reconciliation, to take the story of Christmas and not to mix it with anything else that cheapens it, and to give it away freely so that others like you and I would come to know the joy of having peace with God and living at peace with other people? Are you sold? Are you sold? Because when you, if you're a Christian, when that became real for you, you became a part of that army. You became a part of that movement, that revolution that frankly has never ended. I sometimes wonder why we don't see the things we read about in the book of Acts happening today. I think a lot of it has to do with us, frankly, me, you, our attitudes, our thoughts, our actions, 
how we live. I think all of that plays a role. So here it is, the, the invitation this morning. And by the way, if you don't know Christ, it's Christmas. Receive him. Come to Jesus. He's the only hope of peace with God that you have. He's the only one you've got. There is no one else apart from Christ in which we will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from him. Because the same Savior that died on a cross and walked out of the grave is coming back. And he's coming back as a warrior king. Sword drawn and dividing sheep from goats. Those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ. We don't like that. We like our choices. We like our options. Jesus has given us a choice, if you will. Confess me now. Love me now. Receive me now as Lord and Savior or confess me later. You will confess him. Every one of us will. You can do it now. Convinced that he is the all-sufficient Savior, the Messiah, the promised Christ the anointed one who came to die for you in your place to take the anger and wrath of God for your sin into himself so that payment would be gone and you would have a relationship with God. Or you will pay that penalty for all eternity. If you've never received Christ, if you are walking far from God, then I would just, I'm pleading with you. I'm begging you, give your life to Christ. Christian, hear me. What does God want from you? Give your life to Christ every day. Paul said it this way, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. Have, is that you? I mean, have you died to yourself? Have you, are you denying yourself? Are you yielding yourself? Or are you still battling for your preferences and your wants out there and maybe even in here? You can't claim and then deny. You can't claim your rights and then set them aside at the same time. In Christ, I have no rights other than I get to be a child of God and I get to go on this journey with you and with each other. And I get to be a part of God's family. Church is not a box we check. It's not a, it's not a thing we do. It's who we are. Have you given your life to Christ? If you're lost and Today is your day to give your life to Christ. Christian, today is your life to one more time give your life to Christ. It's not yours. It was bought with a price. We're all slaves. The question is just who's your master? Either sin and Satan is your master or Christ is your master. Your chain is attached to someone. It's just a question of who. If you're not sure of who your chain is attached to or if you know you're not attached to Jesus, then today is your day for him to break the shackles and the chains of sin and death and for you to be a slave unto Christ. The call to Christianity is the call to come and die. That's always been the call. I say, well, pastor, that doesn't, if you're trying to sell me something, I'm not getting it. You're right. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying to persuade you or convince you. Jesus has done all of that. He loves you and he proved it by dying for you. Would you just say yes to him? For those of us who are in Christ and we're members of Crossroads, today is a huge day for us. And I know, again, like I shared earlier, everyone here, some of you may have already given your Lottie Moon gift, and I'm grateful and thank you for sacrificing so that others may know. But today, the invitation is rather simple. We, I'm going to invite the entire church body gathered here, and I know we can't fit everybody up here unless we start stacking people. We don't want to do that because somebody has to be on the bottom. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to invite as many who would come to come. If you have an offering to give, and ushers, where, where are my ushers? You guys in the house, by the way, you didn't know you were done. Um, do we have the plates somewhere? Can we get the plates? We got them close. You guys are awesome. I love our ushers. Can we say thank you to our ushers? Love them. We're going to be, um, we're going to be, we're going to be laying these plates down here just along the front of the platform. And for those of you that have yet to give your gift, your sacrificial gift to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, again, so that others may know. Um, we're going to ask you, and, and, for, if you those, and for the rest of us, we're just going to come and we're going to pray. One, we're going to pray that, that the realities and the truths of Christmas um, would, would just be all over us. 
that Jesus truly would be in his arrival, in, his, in who he is, his attributes, and then ultimately in what he has achieved and what he will achieve when he comes again. I want you to realize and recognize that your life in Christ is now a part of that great story. And that our investments that we make, and by the way, let's just remind it, your money is not your money. I know, some of you, that bothers you because you think it's yours. It's not. God gave it to you and, and he wants us to, to take what he's given us and sacrificially give it to him. You've given your tithes to the ministries of the church. A tithe is different from an offering. This is above and beyond a tithe. This is out of sacrifice. This is out of love. Not a love for crossroads. It's a love for Jesus and a love for people who don't speak your language or live where you live or do what you do. We are saying with one loud voice, Jesus, we love you. And people of the nations, we love you. I want to pray for us and then I'm just going to invite you to, to come and just join me here at the front as we give sacrificially a sacrifice of praise and a sacrifice of resource. Let's pray together. Let's stand. Father, we thank you for your love and for your grace. God, I thank you for the Christmas story. I thank you for the love that you so freely give. And God, I thank you that you, you invite us and, and you, to, be, to be a part of, God, your family. And today I pray that invitation has been loud and clear. And God, for those in this room who don't know you, God, I pray that they would, the offering that they would give would simply be their lives. God, that they would say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, I love you, I trust you. You are God and you died for me and I give my life to you. And God, there would be new life and new birth in this place at Christmas time. But God, I pray also for, God, the gifts that we are about to receive and Lord, for the gifts that have already been received. God, we want to see the world come to a saving faith in Jesus. God, the peace that we know and we enjoy. God, we want the world to know and to have what we have. So God, I pray that our gifts would be born, God, not out of obligation or duty or even just simple obedience, but God, even as Paul prayed earlier, God, that we would cheerfully give sacrificially that others might know the great story of the gospel, how they can be saved, how they can be saved from your anger and wrath, from sin and from death, and God, how they might have eternal life. God, Lottie Moon was one of your incredible servants. She gave her life and every aspect of it to your kingdom. God, there have been countless others, names we know, many we don't, of people who have done that same thing. God, my prayer for Crossroads is that we would be counted among that number, that we would give that we would sacrifice, that we would love the way that you love. God, would you bless this time as your people come and as they lay their offerings down, even as they lay their lives down for the sake of the gospel and for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, if you have a gift to offer, even if you just want to come and pray, I would invite you, and the entire church is invited, all those gathered, come and join here at the front and if you can take a knee where you are and you want to stay and pray let's do that together 